Hello and welcome to ICDD's In Session webinars. Soon you will hear Professor Tian Gu Rao present A Pictorial Approach to Comprehend Symmetry in Molecules and Crystals, Part 1. Please remember to visit icdd.com for information on future free webinars, educational events, product information, and to purchase ICDD's databases and software. I take this opportunity to thank ICDD for giving me this uh, chance to talk about uh, symmetry in molecules and crystals. A very dear subject for me, and this is something which is very, very common among crystallographers in particular. And indeed, it's now becoming extremely popular from the industry point of view, uh, because of the fact that symmetry now seems to control and play many roles in our lives. Uh, in fact, I would like to start by making, taking a statement from uh, M.C. Escher, uh, who, uh, who is uh, an ar abstract artist, uh, and he, of course, he's no more, but uh, he's an abstract artist who captured many aspects which uh, we will come across in molecules and crystals, as you will see as we go through the presentation. So he made a statement from which we, uh, we will begin this uh, webinar. We adore chaos because we love to produce order. And this is interesting because uh, humans uh, would like to always produce order, of course, uh, and then the symmetry plays a major role. Uh, very interestingly, nature also wants to follow uh, the methodology or the other way around. Nature has the symmetry and the humankind wants to follow the symmetry. And even in the art, uh, Escher wants to follow the symmetry, as you can see uh, in this slide. So what I will uh, like to say in the next couple of, uh, in these two uh, lectures in under this webinar series is to cover uh, five major areas. Uh, these areas are three-dimensional objects and representation of stereographic projection. Why is understanding symmetry crucial in our diffraction studies? Pictorial illustration of symmetry operations leading to point group symmetry and so on and then translational periodicity and building space groups. And here we define equivalent points, special positions, and various aspects. How do diffraction patterns incorporate symmetry? That is something we will uh, also discuss uh, towards the latter part of our webinar. So what is very crucial in all these is uh, to see and understand and appreciate symmetry, uh, but then this is an area which is essentially highly mathematics oriented. Uh, in many respects, uh, we need to have a knowledge of group theory and the basics of group theoretical principles and so on and define various aspects associated with group theory, which makes the understanding very easy. But at the same time, we need to study that. Instead, what I was uh, thinking, and in fact, I have been uh, teaching a course related to this topic for several years, one of the things which occurred to me after discussing with a large number of students and associates is that we can actually see, seeing is the best option. So we should look at pictorial representation of symmetry operations. And that, that is the whole idea of this uh, particular webinar series. So let's start at the very beginning. We have the three states of matter, gases, liquids, and solids. So if you want to study particles in a gas, as you see here, they are always in constant motion at normal temperature and pressure. And it is very difficult to identify and arrest one particle and study its properties. So one of the aspects which is suggested is to take the gas, uh, allow it to cool down or uh, apply pressure in such a way that we will end up with a liquid. In case of a liquid, there is some amount of uh, order but this is a short range order. And this short range order also undergoes what is known as Brownian motion. And as a matter of fact, the understanding of any individual particle in a situation like this, again, becomes a tedious experimental as well as theoretical protocol. So the obvious choice is to now cool it further and take it to what we call as the solid state. So study of symmetry in the solid state now becomes the basis for us. 
uh, as I mentioned already, that the symmetry and mankind they exist, there exists a symbiosis. And balanced order and precise is the precision is the concern. And so when we now get into a solid form, the solid can be in two different forms. One is the so-called uh, uh, amorphous form, the other is the crystalline form. So in the crystalline form, we have perfect order. The particles are all in contact with each other. There is long range order extending in all three directions in considering a three dimensional object. So here is a situation where we have arrested this particle. And if you want to study the pro property associated with the particle, they lie inside this solid material. So study of symmetry uh, and structure in the solid now opens up very easy uh, prospect. And that is what we will explore. <clears throat> what do we, when do we say that two objects are identical? And this uh, leads to in mathematics, the theory of isometric transformations. So if we consider, for example, two objects is just a pictorial representation. It's not an ex accurate exact representation, but it makes us understand the whole concept better in the sense that if two objects are said to be congruent to each other, if to each point of one object, corresponds to point on the other. So if you consider point A here, point B there, and point C here, for every A, there is an A prime here, for every B, there is a B prime there, and for every C, there is a C prime. And then the distance between these two points in this object, that is A, B, and B, C, and A prime, B prime, and B prime, C prime, uh, they will be equal to each other. As a consequence, the corresponding angles will also be equal, in the terms of their absolute value. So if you call it alpha, here it is alpha prime, the two values will be the same. <clears throat> and this uh, refers to uh, two types of possibilities. When the angles are of the opposite sign, we call it the opposite congruence. And then we call it direct congruence if the angles are uh, of the same sign. Now, how is this going to help us in understanding the concept associated with symmetry? As we already saw, that in a solid, there is some kind of an order. And this order now extends in all three dimensions. And the best way to understand is to look at some wonderful diagrams <coughs> drawn by uh, E.C. Escher, as I already mentioned, uh, M.C. Escher. Uh, the uh, pictures uh, are very nice, very beautiful, as you see. We have a mythical picture of a, a flying horse, a Pegasus or whatever. And then we have a red horse. One of the features that is associated with this drawing is that there is no empty space, number one. Number two, the uh, distance between one red horse to the other is uh, the same as the distance from this red horse to the next red horse and so on. Now, what, when we mean the distance between these horses, every part of this horse is at the same distance. In other words, the nose of this horse and the nose of this horse is at a distance, let us say, A. It is the same distance between the nose of the white horse and the nose of the red horse. So what we see here is what we call as translational periodicity. It applies to all points in this space. So if we replace now each horse with a point or with a dot, these dots now will form what we call as a lattice. And the separation distance will be what we call as a lattice parameter. We will see that in more and more detail as we go along. And if there are molecules or objects associated with these instead of horses, we have molecules, atoms, and ions, and other kinds of species, <clears throat> then they will also repeat with this periodicity. So this is the translational periodicity in this diagram. Now, keeping this translational periodicity in mind, can we introduce additional symmetry? The next diagram shows the presence of additional symmetry. Here, what is happening is that the yellow uh, flying cat is in the opposite direction of the black flying cat. So effectively, there is a rotation of 180 degrees between these two objects, about an axis. So there's an axis of rotation here. And we have, therefore, a situation where we rotate the, um, uh, the yellow horse by 180 degrees. For example, we can have different kinds of animals putting together. In this particular case, we have a threefold symmetry relating the noses of these three 
mythical birds, relates the uh, three um, fish here, and also the three tartarids. It's a different positioning of the threefold symmetry. So what is very interesting is that there is always this translational periodicity which exists in this in a different concept. So we have the threefold symmetry along with it, the translational periodicity, and that is what builds up this particular kind of a crystalline system. In which case we have, we can have three different molecules coming together at a threefold symmetric point, but the overall crystal formation is a combination of these three, the so-called co-crystals which exist in pharmaceutical industry is a very clear cut example of this kind of a arrangement. We can also have two different conformations of the molecules, the famous Jekyll and Hyde slide of uh, M.C. Escher. So M.C. Escher had this feature of incorporating the translational periodicity along with it, the other types of symmetries which we can associate with a given material, the given uh, motif. And in this case, he has taken different kinds of motifs. So having seen this, what we get the take home lesson from these four diagrams is essentially this, that we have, we can have similar cells that can be drawn in all other repeating wallpaper patterns that we solved previously. That means to say that this unit, which we have drawn here, repeats itself in three dimensions, or in this case, two dimensions, to cover the entire space. No space is left uncovered, number one. Number two, no point in this space is left unconcerned. And every point in this is exactly at the same distance in the next cell. So such a situation, we call this as a unit cell, and therefore we have these unit cells building up our crystal lattice, or in this case, the two-dimensional uh, lattice. So these could be now represented at the edges with points, and those are referred to as lattice points, and this is the so-called translational periodicity, which we say in this. The other issue is where do we fix this? Where is the origin for this? So origin is at our control. So we can have the origin either here or we can have the origin here. The same symmetry is carried throughout. So that means to say that this is a frame. It is like a window frame. We can move from one place where we keep the window, an identical window in the another place and so on. So we can move it along in a given direction along the X axis as well as along the Y axis in this two dimensional diagram. So this now defines our unit cell, our lattices and lattice points and so on. By looking at these diagrams, we get a sort of a pictorial representation of the lattice and the lattice repeat. And therefore we get the concept of unit cell very clearly established by looking at these diagrams. Now we ask a question, we already saw what is this theory of isometric transformations. So what are the operations which will now keep this direct congruence between two objects and opposite congruence between two objects. The direct congruent objects are translation, rotation about an axis, rotation and translation, which is referred to as the screw. We will discuss that as we go along later. So the translation, rotation and rotation plus translation, they are the direct congruent objects. So the objects now are of direct congruence. That means the angle, the inter, inter distance angle is, uh, <clears throat> has the same sign, which is not changing sign. <clears throat> On the other hand, if we now consider the, uh, the objects of opposite congruence, this is the center of inversion, reflection, rotation, reflection, rotation, inversion, and what we later, we will study this as light planes. So these things now form the so-called symmetry operations. So any operation of the standard translation symmetry, the inversion symmetry, they are all referred to as symmetry operations. And these symmetry operations now, as we already mentioned, is not restricted to the objects now, but it is restricted to the entire space. So the entire space is considered, and not the objects, these movements are symmetry operations. <clears throat> so these uh, symmetry operations, therefore, consist of elements. And these symmetry elements are points about which we can have, for example, inversion, axis of rotation, we can have it uh, two-fold, three-fold, four-fold, five-fold, whatever. And then the planes of symmetry, which are now essentially taking the object uh, and then uh, in, in forming an inverse image or forming an image of the object across a mirror. 
So points, axes, and planes are referred to as symmetry elements. So this is the basic definitions which we have come across. So we now have seen a lattice. Uh, we have seen the lattice points. We have seen the periodicity that is associated with a particular arrangement in a solid, which is in fact a arrangement which will now repeat itself in all three directions. And then we identify the nature of these operations, the symmetry operations, and associate them with points, axes, and planes as symmetry elements. Now let us go further. These are, this is like learning a language. You know, when we learn a language, we start from the alphabets, take these alphabets, form words, and try to understand these words, give the meaning. They call them nouns, adjectives, pronouns, verb, and so on, and give an identity to these. And then we now start making sentences and the sentences should now become a meaningful sentence. And we will then eventually end up with the language. So development of uh, the principles that are associated with symmetry operations and symmetry in general in the solid state is like learning a language. So we are now developing the basic uh, definitions, basic alphabets and the verbs and the adverbs and so on. And then we will start forming sentences when we go to the real crystal uh, <coughs> symmetry. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. In uh, crystallography, the, these are now just like in the language where we give A, B, C, D, and so on. In the crystallographic uh, nomenclature, we give them symbols. So if there is a center of symmetry, which is referred to as one bar, it is the, the notation that is given is an open circle. The two-fold rotation is represented like this. Three-fold rotation is represented like this. The representation of this type, which is shown here, is telling us that this rotation axis is coming towards you from the screen, or it is going into the screen, either way. So the direction of uh, the operation is mentioned as well. The direction of the axis is also mentioned. Now, a, a symbol like this represents that we have a two-fold rotation followed by half translation in the direction of the rotation. So it is like driving a screw into the wall. And when we run, rotate this by 180 degrees, the screw goes into the wall by a certain distance and so on. And similarly, the three-fold, four-fold, and six-fold screw axis. We can also have combine a combination of the three-fold rotation with a center of symmetry, four-fold rotation with a center of symmetry, and so on. So these are therefore this symbols that are generally used in crystallographic literature. So when we look at the crystal structures and they are represented in this form in the unit cell, then we know where the two-fold is and so on. If they are in the direction which is other than the direction which is coming towards us or going inside the screen, then we represent them like this. So the two-fold rotation is an arrow. A two-fold screw axis, it should have been two, one here. The two-fold screw axis is now shown half of this and so on. Similarly, a mirror plane is a line. A glide plane, as we call it, is a dashed line, set of, uh, uh, is a set of dashes. <clears throat> and then if it is a diagonal one, which is a dash and a dot, a, a C glide is shown with a set of dots and so on. And when they are happening in the plane of the screen, then they are represented like this. A mirror is represented in this way. And the A and B directions, the direction of A and direction of B is shown. So if this is the A direction, then this will be A and so on. And in the case of the di diagonal one, it shows the diagonal direction. So these are the nomenclatures which you will see when you represent the um, uh, point group and the space group in particular, space group symmetry. You will see all these listed in the International Tables Volume 1. And our job today is to go and see whether we can reach that level in the first part of the uh, series. In the second part of the series, we will actually look at the International Tables and the entries in the International Tables and correlate what we learned today with what we learned in the next week. So point, axes, and planes, therefore, represent our symmetry elements. 
<clears throat> now, what are the properties of crystals? Crystals, we are going to study crystals mainly because we have the periodicity. When once we have the periodicity, we cannot have any number of axes of rotation. So in a typical spherical object, you will have n fold rotation. We can have one, two fold, three fold, four fold, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, up to n fold. But when once we bring in the periodicity into question and into, into the active uh, situation where we have the periodicity in the lattice. So in other words, when once we bring in a periodic lattice like this, where the distance between A and B is the same as distance between this dot and that dot and so on. We have a translational periodicity T, which is represented here. Then if we take sit at this point uh, AB and take B through a rotation, which is the rotation about the A direction, let us say there is a n pole rotation, then the n minus one point will be B prime, which is shown here. And then this distance will be again a translational unit T. Or in other words, if you sit at B and look at A and rotate it, the first rotation away from A will be A prime, and that is at a distance T. So if you now look at the distance B prime A prime, it has to be a multiple of T because it has to keep the periodicity in both two dimensional plane here, which is represented here. It has, it has to be extended to three dimensions very soon. We will discuss why we are discussing two dimensions now. It is mainly because of our education system. We have been asked to think of three dimensions, even though we are born in a three dimensional world, we have been asked to look at two dimension projections. And that's the reason why we are doing it in two dimensions. So we can calculate these values, A, B prime and A prime B, and sub actually evaluate B prime A prime in terms of this uh, simple um, trigonometry. We see that B prime A prime will be T times one minus two cosine delta, where delta is the angle of rotation. <clears throat> so since this has to be a multiple of the translation unit T, cosine delta will be one minus M divided by two. That means we cannot have all kinds of values. This is a cosine function. And we cannot have all kinds of values to end up with m being an integer. For example, m can take only these many values, minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, and 2. The corresponding cosine delta will be this, and the delta values are these. That means to say that we cannot have all kinds of rotation axes that are possible when once they bring the periodicity into account. So in crystals, we will not have n-fold rotations the n-fold rotations, if we do have, there will be either one which is redundant, two, three, four, and six. So two, three, four, and six are the only possible rotation axis which we can have. That way, we can now restrict the molecules, atoms, molecules, and ions, which will now be put into this box. Because in one, once they are inside this box, the so-called unit cell, they have to be obeying the symmetry rules. And if they have to obey the symmetry rules, they cannot have all kinds of rotation axis, as you see here. They can have a two-fold, three-fold, four-fold, and six-fold. And the associated symmetry, which gets generated by the presence of two, three, four, and six. Obviously, the one with a, at a point would be the one which is the center of symmetry, which was shown in an open circle in the previous slide. <clears throat> Let us go to the next slide, where we now consider these as symmetry operations. So we take an object, do this operation, and we now consider these as symmetry operations. We have therefore two, three, four, and six, one being redundant. So we have five possible proper, we call these as proper axes because they are the ones which uh, generate direct congruent objects. So one, two, three, four, and six, the total number of five possibilities can exist as rotation axes. And as a consequence, we can now combine them with a inversion center. When we combine them with an inversion center, these now will be objects of uh, opposite congruence, and they will generate one bar, two bar, three bar, four bar, six bar, the bar representing that we are now taking the object, operating the two-fold symmetry, and then inverting them or um, apply, applying the inversion center. In terms of uh, the coordinates, uh, if we now put x, y, z corresponding to uh, one, then the two-fold axis, which depends upon in which direction we are now associating the two-fold axis. We will see that in detail <coughs> pictorially when we go to analyze the uh, symmetry elements that can be generating the objects 
So we will now discuss the possibilities of how many combinations are possible. As I said, learning the language, we will now get all the details of the verbs, adverbs, and things like that first, and then we will combine them into sentences, and we will see that we make a meaning out of this. So in crystals, without uh, with or without translational operations, so they coexist. These are referred to as point groups. They are also in a loose sense called crystal classes. But when we discuss the crystallographic aspects and talk about solid state crystalline materials, it is better to stick to the definition of point as point groups. We can combine, for example, in a, in a uh, unit cell, the uh, proper and the improper axis together. Then when we have one by one and one bar, we get a one bar. Two and two bar, we get two by M. The two operation, the two bar operation, it actually generates a mirror as we have shown here, and we will see that it is two by M and so on. So we generate therefore a total number of five plus five plus three, 13 point groups. We are all told, of course, already we all know that there are 32 point groups. So how do we generate the remaining ones? We have 13 point groups where there is a single axis operation. We have one, two, three, four, and six only here. And then we have combined them with the improper axis by introducing an inversion center, for example. And therefore, the 13 which we see here are associated with one rotation axis. But it is not necessary that we restrict to one rotation axis because we are in three-dimensional space. So when we are in three-dimensional space, we can have more than one axis intersecting at a point. And in fact, if we consider two different types of rotation axis, here I1 and I2, these are the two rotation axes. Then the point P goes to point Q by the first rotation operation. Q goes to R by the second rotation operation. Then Euler's theorem states that there is invariably a relationship between P and R. That means P, Q, and R are the only three possible positions we can generate, keeping the periodicity intact. So the periodicity now counts in this particular rotation axis control as well. And so we can have these combinations. So, you know, we cannot have all combinations. We can have 2, 2, 2, 3, 2, 2, 4, 2, 2, 6, 2, 2, and 2, 3, 3, and 4, 3, 2. These now define the interaxial angles uh, as is given in this table. I don't think we have time to go into each one of them, except to take a look at these individually later on when we look at the diagrammatic approach of looking at these uh, combination of symmetry axes. So then we can always combine these, these are all proper axes. So we can always combine these proper axes with improper axes. So the proper axes are six, as we saw earlier. Along with that, we can combine it with an improper axis that is inversion center, let's say a mirror, uh, which is also an improper axis because the objects now become uh, opposite congruent objects. And we, when once we have this combination of P and I, Euler's theorem again, the corollary to our Euler's theorem states that the third rotation axis also has to be imaginary. So we can have only these combinations, PII, IPI, and IIP, proper, 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 improper, proper, improper, improper, proper, improper, 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 proper. These are along the three directions, which are shown here. This is, let us say, along the x-axis, this is along the y-axis, and this is along the z-axis, two, two, two. And as a consequence, we can generate all the other possible rotation axes. And from that, we can now combine these. And when we do this operation, we end up with uh, uh, the curve. With this operation, we end up with uh, something like 20, uh, 16 plus. Uh, we had the previous one slide. We'll go to the previous slide. <clears throat> we had 13. So 13 plus 18, uh, 16. Uh, is 29. Now, <clears throat> we, with these uh, combinations of proper, 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 we can also now combine uh, crystallographic point groups with more than one axis, each axis simultaneously being proper and improper. So we can have two, two, uh, two bar, that is two by M, two by M, two by M, six by M, two by M, two by M, and so on. So this now defines a total of uh, 29 plus three, which will take us to the list of 32 point groups. Now, there is this table also in list something else here, which we are going to take it up later on, because we are still 
our understanding at this particular moment is only to collect the alphabets, number one. And number two, we are still in two-dimensional space. Now, what is so special about this two-dimensional space? Uh, in fact, it not only bothers us, it bothers the gods as well. For example, if you see here in this diagram, um, you see Atlas carrying Earth on his shoulder. That is his responsibility. And these three angels want to find the distance between New York and Philadelphia. And they are doing it by looking at the projection, which is caused by shine, this light shine shining on the Earth's surface. And then there is a two-dimensional projection. So we also look at two-dimensional projections of three-dimensional objects. We live in this world. In fact, when you take a flight from Bangalore to Philadelphia, you don't fly from Bangalore is somewhere here. You don't fly like this and come to Philadelphia. What you do is you go up towards the North Pole and come down. And that distance is shorter than the distance which is covered here. Even though this atlas is flattened out at the equatorial plane, and therefore we see this spread across like this. And we can actually find that distances. And so the, uh, the flight path will be going up there almost to the North Pole, coming down from the Greenland area down to United States. That's the path we take. So one of the things which uh, is an issue here is uh, how distorted this can the pattern get. Uh, for, it depends upon how we do the projection. There are different ways in which cartographers draw these projections of uh, spherical arch and get onto two-dimensional patterns. Uh, if you start from the North Pole and uh, then compress it uh, towards the South Pole and spread it out, you get an entirely different map compared to this particular map. So the uh, mapping process uh, has to be mentioned before we look at um, uh, in, uh, just to uh, keep you uh, excited about this whole issue, uh, <clears throat> when I went to New Zealand and I was uh, spending my sabbatical there, uh, I went to a school in Christchurch and the uh, school had a diagram where uh, Christchurch was taken as the center of the earth and the whole earth was compressed at that particular point. So Christ, the map of New Zealand, which is uh, in fact so very small, it's smaller than it's just about the size of probably uh, Pennsylvania uh, or a little bigger. <laughs> but that came as a very big uh, part of the uh, atlas and the United States was much, much smaller. India was very small and of course, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the United Kingdom hardly appeared. It appeared as a spot. So the projection therefore has to be done in such a way uh, that we get an undistorted picture. Now, why do we want to do this? We want to do this because we want to see the symmetry that is associated with the crystals. So earlier days when before, much before X-ray diffraction was discovered, people used to sit and look at the crystals and identify the symmetry that is associated with the crystals. And these crystals therefore have different faces when you, I, I, you know, mostly it is the mineralogists who look into this when the mineral is unearthed and then you get a mineral out, it is in a reasonably large size crystal, you can hold it in the hand and do what we call as crystal gazing, if you wish. But then this is done in such a way that you draw normals to the planes. So if you have a crystal here, you, you put the crystal at the center of the sphere, describe a sphere which will encompass this particular crystal and then draw normals and collect these normals. The normals now go towards the North Pole uh, from the center. There will be normals going towards the south direction. So the northern hemisphere points are now considered, let us say this point. And from that particular point, you draw a perpendicular to the equatorial plane. And that is marked with a certain, uh, let's say, open circle. The ones coming from the South Pole joining this are marked with, let's say, an X. The better diagram is uh, drawn down here. And then uh, you can also see here, for example, if this is the North Pole point, <clears throat> the North Pole and this is the South Pole, we take now this projection down to the South Pole. So the, the, the South Pole is joined to these points in the North Pole, wherever that intersection occurs of the normals which we have drawn. And uh, the uh, points which will come in the South Pole will now join the North Pole. 
and we make a differential between the two by indicating, for example, in this case, this is from the North Pole projection and this is the South Pole projection. So here is a crystal which is uh, whose normals are drawn. These collection of normals are put inscribed into this and this is known as stereographic projection. And with this, what we now identify is the symmetry of the three-dimensional object in two dimensions. So we are very happy. We went to the classroom and in the class we saw this and we are very happy now. So we can study it in two dimensions. So here is the situation in two dimensions. We have two diagrams. One diagram in which we have only one point of intersection and that would mean that we have no other symmetry that is present here. And this is referred to as one symmetry. And this is minus one where we have a center of symmetry at the center, which will now invert this object from here to there. Now this object could be an atom, it could be a molecule, it could be a collection of ions or whatever, or it could be a single object, single atom. In all these cases, it, you see that this particular point group symmetry now turns out to be the one with center of symmetry. So we can therefore identify these rotation axes with respect to these, and this now this uh, series of operations which we can generate. Uh, this will give us, for a, just to give you an example, if you now take this point uh, and then this is the center of symmetry, as we saw in the previous stereographic projection, then if there is a point x, y, z, this x point x, y, z now looks at the center of symmetry, it goes over to the other side, so x becomes minus x, y becomes minus y, and z becomes minus z. The nomenclature that is used in crystallography is to show this by open circle and this by a closed circle with a comma inside. And this is shown as plus and this is shown as minus. That means to say that the circle, open circle with positive is coming towards us and the other one is going inside and there is a symmetry operation one bar. <clears throat> Suppose there is a two-fold operation, the equivalent, these are now referred to, by the way, as equivalent points because they are one and the same because of the presence of the symmetry. So when an object is located at x, y, z, it will automatically generate an object at x bar, y minus z, if there is a two-fold symmetry that is present in the crystalline material. So for example, go back to the two-dimensional projection diagrams of Escher. We saw the two flying cats, the yellow cat and the black cat, and they were related by a two-fold symmetry. So all the other symmetry elements which, which are developed, which can be developed, are shown with respect to their respective equivalent points in this diagram. Of course, there is no need to describe this whole thing, and it will take several hours to describe this. But the basic idea is clear now from one bar and the discussion which we had on one bar and the two-fold axis. So there are 32 point groups. We can list them out. Again, please note that we are now classifying them into different, um, what we now eventually are going to call them as crystal systems. But we'll come to that in a minute. Before that, we will now try to understand the ones, the alphabets which are on the right side a little more thoroughly. And if you look at any textbook, these are given like this. And you will have a real shock because what is this? There are so many colorful things which are shown up here with so many rings and dots and X marks and so on. So this says there are 32 point groups. And uh, of course, there is a nomenclature which will be followed here to understand this chart. What I thought was instead of this, we can again go pictorial and go one at a time so that life becomes easier. In case we have this one and one bar, we will have this position at x, y, z. This position will be at minus x, minus y, minus z. One of the issues we must remember is now we operate the same symmetry again. And that is the reason why it is called a point group. If this is x, y, z, and this is x bar, y bar, z bar, we take x bar, y bar, z bar, pass it through the center of symmetry operation. We will come back to the x, y, z. That means we regenerate these two points and no other points in space can be generated in three-dimensional space because this is a projection in two dimensions. So we therefore have only two equivalent points. And this now defines a one bar symmetry as far as point group is concerned. And this now tells us that our unit cell, which we have to consider in three dimensions should have some restrictions. 
And what are those restrictions which we can have? In this particular case, it so happens that there is no reason for any kind of restrictions. And therefore, we get what we call as a triclinic system. And we will soon see that triclinic system will have no uh, equivalences in the sense that the unit cell A, which is along the x-axis, B along the y-axis, and C along the z-axis, A is not equal to B, not equal to C, alpha, beta, gamma are not equal to uh, each other, are not necessarily equal to 90. In fact, the 90 is redundant. Alpha, beta, gamma are not equal to each other. This defines the least symmetric system. And it's quite possible that crystals would like to have the least symmetry. They want to be more flexible. And uh, so they occupy the three-dimensional space in such a way that the so-called unit cells, which we identified already, have to be repeated in such a way in all three directions that we generate a unit cell where A is not equal to B, not equal to C, alpha, beta, gamma are not equal to each other. And that gives rise to the so-called triclinic system. We will go and look at it a little more in detail very soon. Uh, I will just give one more example uh, because time is really catching up, but this is the very important part where we have to gather all this information then it becomes fairly easy to read any kind of symmetry diagram and therefore eventually to study the crystal structure in the long run. We will see that towards the end of the next uh, talk, we will have got enough uh, basic understanding of this aspect. So if there's a twofold, it looks like this, uh, two bar, which is essentially a mirror, you see both of them falling on each other and uh, one going down, one coming up. So one is open circle, the other is X. And then the combination of the two-fold and the mirror perpendicular to that is will generate four equivalent. So this is now two, this is one, these are four. Now, when we say equivalent points, that means in the case of a triclinic system, there are two equivalent points. That means two molecules will appear in the unit cell in general. And here the four molecules will appear in the unit cell in case of two YM. When we go to higher symmetry systems where we have two, 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 there will be further restrictions. The restrictions therefore have to come on the way in which we define the unit cell. So the way we define the unit cell now will have be, will be different. So in the case of the triclinic, we had A not equal to B not equal to C, alpha, beta, gamma are not equal to each other. And now when we come to the monoclinic system, we have to put restrictions on two of the angles, because if you want to have a two-fold axis, taking this point onto that particular point and back again onto this point, that is the definition of the point group, then uh, this is this stems out from the group theory. So one can prove this using the group theory principles, but we are not doing that. We just look at the diagram and see that this has to fall on this, this has to fall on that. And that is the reason why two of the angles associated with this unit cell should be 90 degrees. So we get the so-called monoclinic cell. We extend the same logic and we go to the orthorhombic cell where we will have A not equal to B not equal to C, but alpha, beta, gamma, all three angles should be 90 degrees because we have three um, uh, axes which are intersecting at the origin and they are in three different directions, A, B, and C. <clears throat> so this can be extended, not spend time on this, but this is just for you to have the slide with you when we look at, if you look at the diary recording again, you can study this slide and carefully study the points which are generated by these operations. You will clear, you will get a clear picture, I hope, of this. In the classroom, I can take more than several hours and then go through all each one of them and explain to the students how these come up. And that is not the idea here. So we, we assume that these are correct diagrams. Uh, based on the logic which we have developed. So hexagonal and cubic. So these now totally come to 32. Now we talked about the um, crystals and they use different shapes. And uh, these uh, shapes are the ones which will now define our so-called crystal systems. So the uh, box which uh, has edges A, B, and C and the angles between the edges is so on. So this box, this kind of a box, in other words, the triclinic cell can host only one type of symmetry element. In fact, two types of symmetry elements. One is no symmetry at all. And the other is the presence of a center of symmetry. 
That means to say that if there is an object inside this and it is now to obey the center of symmetry, then it should have two uh, centers of symmetry inside the unit cell. And that two centers of symmetry, two um, uh, units inside the unit cell across the center of symmetry should repeat itself in all three directions to keep the periodicity intact. So the periodicity, the presence of the symmetries decide now how many crystal systems we can have. And that is the reason why we have only seven. So there are only seven boxes which we can, we can ide idealize. And these seven boxes are the triclinic, monoclinic, orthorhombic, tetragonal, cubic, hexagonal, and rhomboid. And their corresponding uh, ABC and alpha, beta, gamma can be looked at. Apart from that, there is one other special property that is associated with these, uh, these uh, lattices and unit cells. So this is now the, uh, this is the unit cell. We can have these as the lattice points at the unit cell. And if the number of lattice points for this one unit cell is just one, it is referred to as the primitive lattice. Why do you, why you see here eight of them and I'm saying one is because these are now shared by eight other neighbors is in three dimensions. And so this is one eighth each and that total adds up to one. And that is why it is called a primitive lattice. We, in the case of a cubic system, we can have two other types of lattices where the number of lattice systems can be two and one of the lattices can sit in the center and still obey ABC alpha beta gamma 90 and obey all the symmetries that can be associated with the cubic systems. And so we have three types of lattices that are possible and these are referred to as the Brave lattices. So we therefore have a total of 14 for all the seven crystal systems and those are listed here and shown with proper diagrams. And when we come down to, for example, uh, case of uh, triclinic, there is always only primitive cell. Whereas in the case of monoclinic, we have a primitive and a possibly a centered cell. This can be C-centered, B-centered, A-centered, depending upon what is the unique axis direction we take. Because in the case of a monoclinic system, we always have a unique axis about which we stagger the twofold symmetry. So the twofold symmetry is about an axis, and that axis could be either A or B or C. The normal common nomenclature that is used is to take B as the unique axis. That means the angles alpha and gamma are given 90 degrees. So this defines now the 14 Breville lattices, the seven crystal systems, and the 32 point groups. So in the next uh, two, three minutes, I will now combine and bring you to the understanding of what we call as a space groups, which are a combination of the lattice, the crystal system, and the symmetry, which is what will now exist in crystals. And therefore, the objects now find themselves in a situation where they are caged like this. So there are seven different, seven different cases of different kinds of lattices. And then we have symmetries that can be associated with these. In the case of a triclinic system, where tri the system is A not equal to B not equal to C, alpha not equal to beta not equal to, come on, forget the 90 degrees. Uh, it is a primitive unit cell because we have one eighth at each at the edges and no, nothing else in between. The number of lattice points is one. The symmetry can be either one or one bar, that is the point group symmetry. In case we have a point group symmetry one, the equivalent point is only one, which is X, Y, Z, which is a very redundant case. And it is quite possible to have uh, crystals going into this particular, what we now call as a point group symmetry associated with the crystal system, which we now call as the, uh, we combine the primitive unit cell with the symmetry, call it as P1, which now becomes what we call as the space group. So the, uh, Next one is the P1 bar, where we see the uh, relationship X, Y, Z, X bar, Y bar, Z bar. The equivalent points are the two here. And so we write this as general positions, Z is equal to two. Now there are also what are called special positions. See, now you are collecting everything associated with the grammar of the situation. We are now defining all the rules and logistics by means of which we assemble the language of symmetry. And therefore, the language of symmetry in the solid state. We are concentrating only on the uh, language of symmetry in the solid state. And therefore, we are restricting ourselves to rotation axis 2, 3, 4, and 6, 
and the consequences which follow thereof uh, in terms of the other symmetry elements, which can come both as um, direct congruent possibilities and opposite congruent possibilities. And therefore, we see that we can also have what are called special positions. The best way now to look at all these issues is to look at the uh, way in which the arrangements can be put together and put in the form of a diagram. And that is the diagram of what we call as space groups. When we combine 32 point groups, seven crystal systems and 14 breve lattices, what we get overall will be 230 space groups in three dimensions. And that is the one which we are going to study. We're using the entries that are made in the international tables. And before we go into the entries made in the international tables, we are going to study a little more on the aspects related to the other crystal systems. I think we are now nearing the um, time limit, which has been given to me. 22, 23 is the time here in India. That means it is uh, uh, very close to 11.53 now, 11.54 now. And so we have six minutes more. So what I will do is I will summarize what we have uh, gathered today so that uh, you, know, you can brood over the things and gather all the information which we have got. So what we have done is we have got the basic information about the concepts of symmetry, starting from the periodicity which exists in solids. So we first looked at the three states of matter, uh, gases, liquids, and solids, and looked at the solids in terms of the periodicity and the repeat patterns in three dimensions. We found that the, um, the crystals are three-dimensional objects, but then our understanding becomes more clear if we now look at projections. So we did the stereographic projection. And based on the stereographic projection, we displayed our symmetry elements. We looked at all possible symmetry elements one at a time and eventually found that there are 32 possibilities that can be associated with the type of lattices we can have. And we found that these lattices can be put into seven crystal systems. And these seven crystal systems now bear 14 Brave lattices. And the 32 point groups can now be distributed among them. And when we distribute this way, we get what are known as space groups. So the space groups associated with triclinic could now be called P1 and P1 bar. So at this stage, we will make a stop. And then we go into the next uh, talk where we will now study a few concepts associated with space groups, the way the equivalent points get generated and so on. And from there, we will then transfer our results to how we can now get this information out using X-ray diffraction. And how X-ray diffraction sees all these in terms of what we call as the reciprocal lattice. So we have to get a concept of the reciprocal lattice clear first, and then look at the possibility of looking at X-ray diffraction results and how the X-ray diffraction results will give us all this information about crystal systems, point groups, and space groups. And then eventually the positions of the atoms, which will be now expressed in terms of already, we have seen equivalent points. So it will be expressed in terms of X, Y, Z. So we get the realistic positions of the atoms inside the crystals. So this is where we stop and I'm uh, ready to take any questions which come up at this moment. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, Guru, for another great presentation. I'm sure everybody's looking forward to part two, which is next week. Um, I have one question here that wasn't answered during the presentation. Um, uh -huh. It says, Carla would like to know if you could explain the meaning again of special position. Okay. All right. <clears throat> See, I put special positions and question mark. Uh, let me take this diagram. I think that will be easier. So if you now look at these uh, possible equivalent points in this uh, space group P1 bar, X, Y, Z and X bar, Y bar, Z bar are related to each other. So we said that if we sit here, we generate that point. If we sit there, we generate this point. And that appears to all the points in this space as we already discussed. So any point, suppose we sit here, it will be center symmetrically related to the point over here. 
So there are equivalent points which are two. So Z is equal to two. So there are two general positions. Now suppose I put X equals zero, Y equals zero, Z equals zero, and then put it up here at the origin. Now we operate the equivalent points. Zero, 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 minus zero, minus zero, minus zero is same as zero, 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 okay? And therefore now Z now is not two, but it becomes one. That means we can have molecules, atoms or whatever sitting at the origin associated with this crystal system. And that can give us uh, the possibility of having a special position because Z is now one, even though the space group allows two possibilities. This is true with all these positions which are now at the edges because these are now translational periodicities. That means 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0 in the di x direction, uh, two, 1, 0, 0 in here, 1, 0, 0 in the x direction, uh, 1, 1, 1, 1, uh, 0, 1, 0 in the y direction, and 0, 0, 1 in the z direction. So all these three uh, possibilities uh, are similar. On the other hand, because of the presence of the symmetry, we will see that in the next uh, um, uh, session as well, the next week, that the special positions not necessarily be restricted to this position 0, 0, 0, but they can also be associated with half 0, 0, 0, 0, half, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, eight equivalent positions for special positions, and they will be different. So there are eight different special positions in the triclinic system. So in the next uh, presentation, I will start from that stage so that we can get a clear idea of what these special positions are about. Possibly uh, while we do this uh, second session, uh, we will get a clear understanding of the special positions. I think uh, I have answered it partly at this moment. Don't forget to like and follow ICDD on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook. More information on ICDD.com. Contact us at info at ICDD.com.